Perfect. Um, all right, so today's speaker is Shunan Wu. He's a fifth year uh, MPO student working with Brian Soden. Uh, he got his undergrad degree at the National Taiwan University in Atmospheric Science, then got his master's degree from the same university in Atmospheric Science. And uh, Shunan has been here for almost five years. He's a um, very good tennis and badminton player, which you may not have known. And um, in his time here, his favorite part of Miami is the weather, but his favorite part of Rasmus is the people. And um, today he's going to be talking about clouds and tropical cyclone intensification. Oh. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about the role of clouds in tropical cyclone intensification. And this work is working with my advisor, Brian Soden, and also Ed, and also some collaborators from different universities. So that's being from the tropical cyclone intensification. And trump's cyclone intensifies when the energy provided is greater than dissipated. That means when tropical cyclone has, uh, when the net energy in the trump cyclone is positive, trump cyclone is going to intensify in the future. So if we can further investigate or figure out how energy cycle works in tropical cyclone, then we can better predict the future tropical cyclone intensity. And both latent heating and radio heating are important important energy source for tropical cyclones. So in today's talk, I I will try to uh, examine the tropical cyclone intensification from these two different perspectives, and also uh, investigate the relationship between clouds and tropical cyclone intensification. So here's outline here. <coughs> And the part one is trying to use the perspective of landing heating. And the second part is using the radiant heating. And follow up by summary, and last is future works. So in part one, we try to use cloud, especially cloud eyes, as the proxy, and try to find if there's any signal of PC intensification in this product. So here, I'll introduce the importance of learning heating to PC intensification first, and then use the cloud side measurements of ISO content to figure out is there actually a signal of PC intensification. So here's a cartoon for the tropical cyclones. It's the yellow line here is the transverse circulation for tropical cyclone from I, I will to its environment. And traditionally, latent heating is considered as the major energy source for TC intensification. When the latent heating is released at different places, it has different energy transforming efficiency. For example, when it is released around a warm course height and, uh, and near the TC center, it has the highest energy transforming efficiency compared to uh, if learning heat is released uh, outside the TC or TCI wall. However, there is no real observation of learning heat release that we can use to improve our forecasting. So we try to use the cloud I, especially cloud ice as a proxy for latent heat release because when the latent heating is released near this height around 8 kilometers where there is the highest energy transforming efficiency and when latent heating is released around that height it always accompanied with the condensate formation so around that height that is cloud ice so that's why we want to use the cloud ice as a proxy for letting heat release around that time. And a lot of another advantage of using cloud ice is there's the lab measurements that provide observational ice water content. So here we know <coughs> that heating is critical in influencing the, the evolution of carbon cyclone intensity. And also, cloud ice can be used to approximate the energy release in mid to high troposphere. 
So I, our hypothesis here is clarifies what content, content information about race, desertification, and TC intensity. Then we can use the product of clarifies what content trying to find the signal of TC intensification. And the product we used here is CloudSat iSwat content. And so what is CloudSat? CloudSat was a part of uh, a trend constellation which assembles seven uh, satellites. And the, uh, one of the big advantage for CloudSat is it provides very high resolution observations. Its horizontal resolution is about 1.1 kilometer with 125 vertical labels. So now CloudSet provides virtual profiles of cloud ice like water content. And here is an example of the CloudSet overpasses penetrate through from cyclones. This is a uh, uh, typhoon one in 2009. And you can see uh, CloudSet can depict the very detailed uh, distribution of cloud ice. For example, you can see an I here and I over here. <coughs> so now we have our measurements. The, sec the next step is trying to define the change, change in TC intensity. So here we define that if TC intensity grows by 3 meters per second after 6 hours, it is defined as an intensified TC. If it weakens uh, 6 hours later, we define it as a weakened TC. Hey, uh, Shinan, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, go back to the previous slide. Sure. I think um, it's an important point here, which maybe the audience doesn't know, right? Uh -huh. That That's not CloudSat in the lower right. Sorry? Lower right, that's not CloudSat. Oh, no, that's not CloudSat. So what's, what's the width of that swat? Okay. So it's, the width of the swat is only 1.4 kilometer, so it's very thin. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, sir. that's very important distinction. Yeah. So, uh, as Dave just mentioned, because the swath of cloud set is very narrow, so cloud set typically they don't always path to the TC center. So when we want to make a composite of tropic cyclones from cloud set measurements, we need to define one point on every overpass that has the shortest distance to TC center, and use this point as the same central to make a composite. <coughs> so here are composites for intensifying and weakening TCs of the uh, cloud as well content. As you can see, for intensifying, uh, sorry, the shadings are as well content. The x-axis is axial distance to the zero point, and the y-axis is the height in kilometer. And as you can see, intensifying TCs generally have more actual content than you can DC. And we refer to popular differences. Red shading strip means intensifying TC has more actual content than we can DC. And these positive differences spread across the entire domain. Uh, because we just mentioned, except for the rate of intensification, TC intensity itself also influences the amount of actual content. So we further uh, categorize our uh, TC overpasses into four TC intensity categories based on the initial TC intensity. And four intense categories are truck pressure, truck storm, minor, and major TCs. So now we can have more fair, uh, much more fair comparisons between intensifying and weakening TCs. So after we separate into four intensity categories, intensified TCs still have greater amount of ice or content than we can TC, except for major TCs, which uh, where the signal is kind of randomly. So we further calculate the mean ice or content. So we calculate the mean of actual content and make the bar graph like this. The first uh, four uh, colors, red colors is for intensifying TC, blue colors 
is for EKTC and different four groups represent four different intensity categories from trouble depression to stronger TC intensity. And as you can see, intensifying TC still have greater actual content than we can TC. And we further extend our forecasting time from six hours up to 24 hours. And we can still see the signature still exists. Except for a major TC, which doesn't have a clear signature. And since, since now we know there's a signature of TC intensification in ISOP content, how about rapidly intensifying TCs? So we repeat the same analysis for compar uh, for ISOP content and then make a composite for four intensification rates, which are weakly, neutral slow intensifying and rapid intensifying TCs. And as you can see here, there is a clear difference. As we as the intensification rate becomes greater, the amount of ISOR content also becomes more. So this is a very encouraging result. But if we further look into the intensity distribution of four for four intensification rates, you will find out the rapid intensifying TC has stronger average intensity than other groups. So the signal we saw here might be an artifact of the intensity uh, average intensity, uh, sorry, average TC intensity is higher in rapid intensifying TC. So that's why we also separate uh, these overpasses into four intensity categories and then compare and then make a comparison between four different intensification rates. And the blue bar, uh, sorry, yellow bar is for rapid intensifying TCs. And here you can see, except for a major TC, rapid intensifying TC still have stronger in actual path than the rest of the groups. Uh, for a major TC, our, uh, our guess is that during the I period, the major, uh, the typically in the main, uh, sorry, in the major TC phase during the I period, the initial TC intensity is weaker than the rest of the groups. So that's why we saw there is much weaker in actual path compared to other groups in rapid intensifying TC. So for the part one. We know that cloud ice serves well as a proxy for landing heating and has a potential to be an indicator for TC intensification. And we know that intensifying TC tend to have greater amount of ice water content than we can TCs. In addition, rapidly intensifying TCs also have greater ice water, ice water path than other intensification rates. So here, so after the first part, here is the second part, and the second part is we're trying to use the, um, trying to discuss the TC intensification from the radiative heating perspective. So here, we're trying to discuss the interactions between cloud and radiations, and how these interactions affect the TC intensification. So. To start with, I will start from why cloud radiative heating is important to the evolution of the trouble cycle. And in this section, I will use uh, NASA series measurement and also idealized both simulations to do the investigation. So radiative heating, very uh, basic concept is when uh, solar uh, was when the sun emits solar radiation to the earth, the surface receives this energy. It will be emitted back outward. If there's nothing above like clear sky, then this the wave radiation would emit outward directly. So however, if there is the clouds over there, this cloud will trap this the wave radiation and we need back for underlying and then provide extra energy for our underlying and spray color.
And if we have a cloud in this area and no cloud in these two area, the the area underlying clouds would gain more energy compared to the area without clouds above. So how do we relate it relate it to PC dislocation? So if you remember the plot I showed at the beginning, this is the composite of ice water content for intensifying weekend TC. And if you can focus on the only on the ice water content differences, we'll figure out the enhancement of cloud ice water content is spread out across the entire domain. So it was we suspect that this enhancement of cloud ice may not only be the indicator for this intensification, maybe this enhancement also provides extra radiant heating from clouds for carbon cycle to intensify. So here we use auxiliaries from cloud set uh, measurements. They provide the radiative fluxes at the top of atmosphere. So we calculate the net long wave radiative fluxes at the top of X sphere for different uh, intensity category. The red line is for intensifying TC, the blue line is for weekend TC, and X axis are is for the axial distance. And Y axis is the energy unit. So the positive means there's more extra energy provided from clouds. And as you can see, for intensifying TC, it has more energy provided from clouds than a weekend TC. And this signal is the same for all intensity category except for major TC, which, do, which doesn't have very clear signal. So now you know clouds that absorb and emit radiation, changing the magnitude of radiative fluxes. And also clouds is able to alter spatial distribution of radiative heating and may subsequently change the precipitation and cloud fields. We think that the interactions between cloud and radiation can strengthen the intensity of trop tropical convective systems, which is tropical cycle. So, and now I want to use, here we use uh, NASA series measurement of radiative fluxes to do, trying to investigate whether cloud radiative heating has an influence on the TC intensification. So what is Sirius? So Sirius is clouds and the Earth radiant energy system, which provides a continuous record of Earth radiation budget. So this figure is the monthly mean of downward short wave radiative fluxes at surface. And my job is trying to locate carbon cyclones in these maps and pulling out, make a composite for intensifying and weakening PCs. When we do a composite, we mostly do it for parameters called correlative heating or correlative effect. And correlative heating here, uh, uh, in my talk, it usually refers to the radiative heating in the atmospheric column. So it is the uh, energy in the atmospheric column. So it is calculated by the net radiative fluxes subtract net radiative radiative fluxes at surface. And then cloud radiative effect is the radiative fluxes. Oh, sorry, the differences in radiative fluxes between all sky and clear sky conditions.
So here are composites of carved radiative heating for tropical cyclones. The neck column is for weakened TC. The mid column is for intensified TC. And the right column is for uh, its differences between weakening and intensified TCs. Different row represents different intensity categories. The shadings are cloud radiative heating. And xy is the latitude and longitude. And as you can see, cloud radiative heating concentrates within five degree latitude and longitude of the TC center. And if we look into their differences, the positive signal uh, occurs within also within five degree latitude longitude of the TC center. And these are the same for four intensity categories. And also the environment is either negative or very small positive. So this is also for six hour intensity change. We want to see whether this signal can also be found when we extend our lead time, which is forecasting time up to Early. So here are uh, the bar graphs for different lead times. So different groups represent for uh, different lead times. And for here are eight bars here. Red bar is for intensified TC. Blue bar is for weekend TC. And it, uh, two pair, uh, two as a pair. They are four pairs and four. Each pair represents for different intensity categories. So for different uh, big forecasting times, sorry, for different forecasting times, uh, intensifying TC always have stronger cloud radiative heating than weakening TCs up to seven, up to seventy two hours. So except for TC intensification. We will maybe uh, the radio because the magnitude of radio heating and latent heating is usually comparable when the TC intensity is, uh, is weaker. So maybe when the TC sorry when TC is weaker or before it genesis, the radio heating might have much stronger influences on the the development of current cycle. So that's why we further look into uh, if there's any um, any differences or signal of tropical cyclone genesis in uh, cloud radiative heating. So the left column is for not developing dis uh, tropical disturbances. The mid column is for developing disturbances, and different row represent different forecasting time. So and the four, and here the way we define on developing and develop, developing the disturbances is based on if tropical disturbances reaches TC intensity after certain hours. For twenty four hours is uh, if these uh, disturbances reach the TC intensity after twenty four hours. If it reaches TC intensity, we define it as developing. If it is not, then we define as not developing. And here you can see for developing uh, disturbances, it has stronger correlative heating than not developing cases. And this signal is pretty clear and solid up to 72 hours. And after 72 hours, there's some signal, but it's not as robust as we saw prior to three days. And from now we we are dis we are mainly discussing about the effect of cloud radio heating up, but not the interactions between cloud and radiation. So here we are going to talk about the in how interactions between cloud and radiation affects the PC intensity evolution. So we need a matrix for it. And here, 
to use the more, sta more static energy to represent the activity of convection. So most static energy resembles the temperature, internal energy, and duplication energy, and also the moist energy. And in previous study, they found that when the tropical convective system develops, typically the variance of column integrated moist stacking energy also increases. And there are three major terms that affect the evolution of this, uh, this term for this quantity. So which are surface enthalpy fluxes, net uh, radiative fluxes and also the convergence of itself. And in previous study they have shown that the radiative terms dominates these feedbacks. So it has the largest contribution for the evolution of the most the variance of moist static energy. So we want to calculate these terms. However, it is difficult to calculate more static energy from observations. But in the tropics, typically the variation of more static energy is usually dominated by the variation of white vapor. So here I'll use the white vapor as trying to use it to represent the variation in more static energy. So this term here, I will try to multiply them into the Q prime, which is the mixing ratio prime times the net radiation prime, and trying to see if it is it is if this term is positive. That means it has the positive feedbacks that can uh, increase the more static energy. Virus. So here in this figure, the left column is stand for weakening TC, the mid column is for intensifying TC, and the right column is for differences between intensifying and weakening TCs. First of all, you will see there is positive signs in the entire domain. That means the moist region get moister, dry region get drier. So this is the positive signal in both weakening and intensifying TCs. But if we further look into the differences, you can see the strongest positive signal, uh, positive feedbacks occurs within five degree next to a longitude of the TC center. So that means interactions, cloud gradient feedbacks provides the uh, can help the TC to intensify because of these feedbacks. And so far we mostly use the measurements to diagnose the feedbacks or the importance of each term. Now we try to actually look if we take uh, a take of the radiative heating from clouds, what will happen to the evolution of tropical cyclones? So here we will use idealized wolf to perform a series of sensitivity experiments. Here I used the uh, Wolf 3.9.1 version with horizontal resolution of 6 km and 6 levels in the vertical. The one thing special about our simulations is we use the point pound scaling method developed by Dave, and this is a very convenient tool because we can adjust the vertical wind shear as we want, and this vertical wind shear can be maintained for the entire simulation. So at the beginning, 
I have one comfort simulation and another one sensitivity experiment of no clouds. That means I turn off the radio heating from clouds. So there's no radio heat, radio heating from clouds for no cloud simulations. <coughs> As simulation begins, the control simulation and no cloud simulation looks similar. But after 16 hours, the control simulations, the vortex in intensity in the control simulation start to increase and, re and reach the PC intensity here. But for the no cloud simulations, the, the intensity of the vortex never reached intensity, a PC intensity category. So that means, that means for no cloud simulations, when we take off the radio heating from clouds, then this vortex cannot be intense, uh, cannot be strengthened. But someone might argue about because you take off some energy away from the simulations, so that's why this vortex doesn't develop in the future. So we design another experiment. We add back cloud radio heating. But instead, we homogenize this cloud radio heating for the entire domain. So we still have the energy in the simulations. The way we did that is we're trying to break the interactions between cloud and radiation. So here are uh, simulations, the same for control and for homogenized radiative heating. The, uh, this is not very obvious, but for the red line here is for the old clouds uh, for homogenized radiative heating simulations. And as you can see, the homogenized one, even when you provide cloud radiative heating, the vortex doesn't develop after in our simulation time here. So for the control run, it reaches uh, T it, sorry, it reaches TC intensity around 60 after 60 hours. But for the rest of two, no clouds and homogenized <coughs> simulations, it never genesis into TC intensity in our simulation time. So that means for cloud rate cloud radio heating can alter <coughs> the evolution of TC dot vortex in the idealized simulations. Also, not only the heating itself, but cloud radiative cloud radiative interactions also regulate the evolution of TC dot vortex. Except for the initial vortex intensity of 10 meter per second, we try to play. We try to modify the initial vortex intensity from 5 to 20 meter per second. And for the 20 meter, uh, the initial intensity is stronger. The evolution between three simulations are similar, but after. Uh, but when we try to decrease the initial vortex intensity, the clear difference appears between the control run and the rest of two simulations. So, for the uh, for the part two, which we try to use the perspective of radio heating to see how clouds and clouds and radiation interactions to influence the TC evolution. Here we know that cloud radio heating substantially influences the evolution of tropical cyclone. And developing tropical cyclones or TC that oh, tropical disturbance that genesis typically they tend to who have greater amount of cloud radiative heating than non developing tropical cyclones. And cloud radiative interactions 
accelerate the process of genesis and sometimes even can trigger this genesis under unfavorable conditions. So for the first part of my work, we use the latent heating perspective. And we know satellite measurement of ice water content can be of potential to predict TC intensification. And also there's a signal of TC rapid intensification in ice water content. And from the second part, we know that cloud radiative interactions play a crucial role in regulating the evolution of current cycles. For future works, because we have the tool called uh, like point blank scaling methods, so we can play around with it, trying to create different environments for our simulations and to further examine the role of cloud related interactions to traffic cyclone evolutions. But for example, we can adjust the shear in the environment or the sea surface temperature and trying to see if the environment changes, if whether if we can still see the same kind of result we saw in the previous talk. A second is we will use the edge wolf retrospective simulations to investigate whether this operational uh, forecasting model also have the same signal we saw in satellite measurement and also idealized wolf simulation. This is the very prelim preliminary result from the H wolf. Uh, the x axis and y axis is the latitude and longitude from the TC center. And different rows represent different intensity categories. And here we can see also intensified TC is uh, typically have stronger cloud heating than the uh, weak TC, except for mega TC, uh, because it's just a very preliminary analysis. So I, I, I am not sure why the mega TC has the opposite size here. Maybe it's just because the weak TC has stronger TC intensity than the intensified TC here. So that's all I have. Thank you. So we don't want it too far from too far from the TC center. Okay, it's curious because 300 is still outside the yes. core, and I'm just wondering if you're accepting squads from any azimuth within that radius. The weakening cases will have a significant fraction of squads that are entirely within the upstream quadrants and therefore quite dry. I'm wondering if that plays a role in determining the lower average ice water content in that composite. Lots. Possible, but to do that, that might take a lot of effort because at the beginning you need to know the shear directions. Then you can know the quadrat you need for, like for example, the dry quadrat. And then you so that yeah that that is possible, but the thing is. I guess because we, if we try to decrease the distance from the DC center, for example, only a hundred kilometer from the DC center, that would largely uh, decrease our sample sizes. So that's another issue. That's why we take three hundred kilometer as our criteria to select our overpasses. Uh, do cloud? Types make any difference? So, 
you were averaging all clouds, right, in the um, all sky minus uh, clear sky. So if you had a low cloud or a high cloud um, that has different rate, like back radiation properties, do you think that would make a difference? Not surely make a huge difference, but I guess because of the carbon cyclones, it's typically the big convections. So the cloud paths in my composite should be more consistent um, uh, between different cases. So even though that might be a case, but I, I think that wouldn't cause the problem in my composite. <coughs> so you showed that uh, developing storms had a greater ice water content mm -hmm. and greater cloud radiative heating. Do you think there's a direct link there between, like say if you have more ice crystals in a storm, that would provide the storm with more cloud condensation nuclei? a greater coverage of clouds, um, leading to greater radioactive feedback. Uh -huh. So do you think there's like a direct link there between the amount of ice you have and um, that lead to more heating yeah. in clouds? Yeah, exactly. So that's the that's exactly the topic I'm talking. I was talking about in my second part. So that's the interaction between clouds and radiation. So if we have more clouds, which, which means we have, which means we have more cloud ice. Sorry. So here, when we have more cloud ice, this cloud ice might absorb more long wave radiation and bring it back and trying to provide more extra energy for M3 column. So okay. that intensifies the time. Okay. But you're not, um, as an issue of causality, right? So if I were looking at a cloud cluster uh, and it had more clouds, mm -hmm. right? Then, I mean, if it had more convection, it would have more clouds already. Right. And when, when you're looking at your analysis, when you see mm -hmm. more cloud radiated heating, you're also seeing more clouds. Right. So the causality there is not. Uh, certain, right? When you're looking at a cluster and seeing it has more cloud radiated heating because it has more clouds, it might have more clouds because there's more thunderstorms. Right. You know. Right. So, um, I think it kind of gets to uh, Mary Beth's point. Like, would, could you pre identify a situation with similar cloud coverage or cloud amount but different amounts of EV radiated forcing? You know what I'm saying? Like if I'm looking at it, if I'm looking at a visible satellite image, you know, I'm going to see a big white ball, right, out there. And but is it possible to find one that has more radiated heating than another? Or is, or in the tropics, like you said, are all clouds just high clouds? No, I, that's, that's possible. Because otherwise, someone would just look at it. It's like, of course, it's going to become a. You know, of course, it's developing quickly. It's a big, you know, it's covered with thunderstorms and high clouds. It looks like it's going to be a storm. Yeah. So there's. I know there's another study, they try to prescribe the vertical part, a different vertical profile radiated heating for the, for the simulations and trying to see if we add more radiated heating in the mid troposphere or high troposphere, that, how does that affect the evolution of PC intensity? Mm -hmm. So that kind of related to your questions, I guess. Well, I guess from the satellite perspective, right? Could you look? Could a, could you get something from a satellite image where so to, the, to to an operational forecaster, they might look at an image and be like, "Well, those are basically both the same to me," but something, some sort of uh, an outgoing long wave radiation measurement would actually identify one as <laughs> having more radiated heat than another. So I guess in a cloud set, yes, we can do that, but for the satellite image. Yeah, I guess the, for the amount of clouds, you might need to use uh, the cloud ice or liquid water as to represent the amount of clouds and trying to use it to relate it to the rate of heating you saw here. So yeah, there's other satellite products that has 
the liquid water content and the ice water path. Or liquid, sorry, liquid water path and ice water path. I can you can use to represent the amount of clouds. Then you can try to one by one to examine if it's it's actually proportional between the amount of cloud and radio heat. Yeah. Mm. Thank you.